Welcome to this inaugural segment of Café con Luis, where we bring to you issues of public policy importance that impact the Latino community in the state of Connecticut. And with us today, uh, Secretary of State Denise Merrill. Denise, welcome. I am, thank you. I am proud to be here for your maiden voyage. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very, very much. So uh, just an uh, in, informal chat so our viewers will know a little bit about you. Can you tell us uh, uh, some background history? Where are you from? Where, where did you study? Uh, what is your passion? Uh, what family values, if you would, uh, brought you to this phase of your of, of your professional life? Well, thank you for Political asking. Political life. Uh, well, first of all, I did not grow up in Connecticut. I grew up in California in the 1940s and 50s. So I'm older than I look. Go ahead, you can say it. <laughs> okay. uh, and uh, I lived in a little town just south of San Francisco um, with a, a very Hispanic, mostly Mexican background uh, to, to our town as many towns are in California. Mm -hmm. So my family were immigrants from Ireland. My grandmother started a business, dry cleaners business, and my father and his brothers and sisters all worked in the business from the time they were little, as did I. So uh, my grandmother was the sort of the um, mother of the outfit and probably uh, the best businesswoman. My grandfather, not so much. He was the gardener. He was the gardener. <laughs> he was a gardener. <laughs> okay. He literally uh, re helped establish the rose gardens in San Francisco Golden Gate Park. Really? Yes. How he was interesting. He's a very serious gardener. Yes. Ah, very serious, I would say. Yes. So, are you like me, the eldest of your siblings? I am. Oh. Yes. One girl, four boys. Oh. So okay. I was also the mother of our family in uh -huh. many ways because uh -huh. I was 13 years older than my youngest brother. Okay. So my two smallest brothers, I babysat and took care of a lot when I was in high school. Uh -huh. That was what I did. And how? <laughs> and so, how did you translate what? the values of your family, your nuclear family, to your family uh, today after, af after having your own children. And, yes, and I have three children, four grandchildren now. And, um, you know, I think it's a different world because my family, we all grew up within one block of each other. All my cousins, 17 cousins, you know, everybody lived there. And now everything is so much more mobile. And I really relate that to some of the problems we have with our election system. People don't remain in their same communities forever. They move around a lot more. I mean, look at me. I'm in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. I grew up in California. One of my brothers is now in Colorado. One is still in California. And one's in uh, Georgia. Huh. So we, you know, people move so much now. It's much yeah. harder to keep track of them. Our family is still very close, though, because mm -hmm. we have the Internet. And right. so now we talk to each other on Skype. Ah, interesting. <laughs> interesting comment. So there's a kind of a lifelong affiliation with your local officials and local politics. Well, uh, yes. My father was very involved with local politics um, mm -hmm. because he owned a small business in the town. Uh, it, the town was called Millbrae. It's just where the San Francisco airport is. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother was very involved. And my, my first experience in politics was my mother was kind of the ward boss of our neighborhood. So when someone moved to my neighborhood, it was a, a very much Irish Catholic neighborhood, very middle class. Everybody worked in town. And uh, she would sign them up for the party. Uh, they'd bring uh, her over the kitchen table, uh -huh. have a little coffee, just like this, uh -huh. and uh, sign you up. Huh. <laughs> Politics over coffee. That's right. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> That's where I grew up. We, 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 we have similarities in our culture. Mm -hmm. um, Denise, you've, you've been a, a key mover, uh, if not the principal mover, of Election Day registration. Um, very important legislation, I believe. I, I remember coming to Connecticut back in the late 70s, early 80s, I believe, when the, you had to be registered 21 days before an election in order yes. to vote. Uh, that's been reduced systematically to now with this new legislation. Uh, 
being able to register on the same day that an, that, that an election occurs if you are not already registered previously. Uh, does that hold true for changing parties as well, or is that different? And how will how will this law uh, be implemented at the poll? If, 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 I, if election day comes around and I all of a sudden decide, oh my goodness, I just moved to this place two months ago, I haven't changed my registration. Uh, how how can I vote? How, what do I do? That is the exact purpose of this law, and I believe that these the ways that we've done voter participation have been sort of subtle barriers to people coming down to vote. For exactly that reason, because people move all the time and they don't always change their registration, and we want to make sure that every eligible person can vote on election day. Eligible meaning. You're 18, at least 18 years old, and you're a citizen of the country. You have that right to vote, and it's our job to make sure you get to exercise that right. So what we have on Election Day frequently, a lot of people come in saying, oh, I forgot, you know, I didn't know, I, I changed my driver's license, but I, you know, I didn't know I also had to change my voter registration. A lot of problems on Election Day. Now, what we will do is, if you get there and for whatever reason you're not on the list, you can go to usually City Hall. It'll be just one place because the voter list is a very carefully protected list, as you can imagine. And it's still a kind of an old system in that it's not like in the cloud or anything like that. It's, it's a closed loop. Every town has one place where that active list can be changed. So that voter will go to town hall, usually, maybe it's a room in town hall or something, and they will register to vote right on the spot, provided they have the same information you need to identify yourself as you always do when you have to register to vote. At that point, after the registrar will register that person and then give them a ballot. And it'll be very similar to a, an absentee ballot. And you will vote right there and you will seal it in a special envelope and that vote will be set aside. The registrar will then check the list to make sure you're not, if you're registered somewhere else, they take you off there, they put you on there, and you're done. Interesting. So, um, I've spoken to some folks who were not sure exactly how it was going to be implemented, but this is really clear, crit critically important to the voter. Uh, you, if you're not registered to vote on election day and you wish to vote on election day, you must go to your town hall. You right. cannot go to the poll itself. That's right, because, because you won't be on their list. You will not be on their right. list. But at City Hall, they have the state list that's required for somebody to check if you're registered in another town. Right. Uh, any nuances if you've just moved here from out of state? No, I mean, you are a resident of the town you live in on election day. Everyone is. Okay. And I think we get a lot too hung up in this whole residence thing because mm -hmm. really what that's intended is to make sure somebody's not trying to vote more than once. Right. That's the only reason right. we do that. Right. And so if you come to a, a town hall, they'll be able to check to see if you voted somewhere else in Connecticut. And if so, well, you're in big trouble. <laughs> ah, yeah, absolutely. That's... Uh that's or they can move you. You know, yeah. if you were living in East Hartford and you moved to Hartford mm -hmm. and you just haven't registered or changed your registration, you can change your registration too. Okay. It doesn't have to be a first time registration. Okay. Okay. Very good. So, uh, uh, another important factor that you mentioned is, is to make sure you have the information that's necessary to identify yourself. Yes. What 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 is this? A driver's license? Is there some type of state issued identification that's necessary? Uh, what are the alternatives? Uh, alternative pieces of information that you may be able to use. This is a very important point because, as you know, there's been a lot of discussion about should you have to have a specific voter, you know, photo ID, or can anything else do? I think our law is great because it makes sure you are who you are, but it also has a lot of flexibility. You can use a driver, Connecticut driver's license, of course. Even if it has the wrong address, it's okay because it identifies, it has a picture of you and it has your name. But you don't have to have a driver's license. You can use anything that has 
two pieces of information, either your name and your address, maybe a utility bill, or a, a, you know, a mortgage statement, anything with your name and to show that you live at a certain address. Okay. Doesn't have to have a picture. You know, there's a lot of people that worry about this sort of thing. Um, I happen to think that this is not the big problem everyone has made it to be. Our law lets you, or you can even get, it in case you don't have an ID with you at all, but let's say your name is on the list and you don't happen to have anything and you want to vote that day, you can still sign an affidavit saying, yes, that's me, yes, I live there, yes, I'm eligible to vote. And you still should be allowed to vote. See, I think that's a great law. Another, another critical piece of information, and, and in terms of my own personal participation in, in political campaigns in this state, uh, that's something that many elections officials do not know. I know. <laughs> and we're always fighting. In fact, I introduced a law this year which did not pass, but that has a little chart that shows you exactly what you can use. And I think we should have that chart at every checker's desk so everyone is on the same page. I, I, I agree. That's yes. very, very, very important information. Now, your coffee's going to get cold. Oh, Maybe gosh, we should no. take a, a breather to make sure. <laughs> ah, very good. Mm. Hmm. So perhaps a little, uh, a little bit for the, for for our viewers uh, regarding um, uh, voting and elections in, in 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 this country. We know that that the uh, uh, the right to vote was not in the in, in the Constitution was not uh, in the Bill of Rights. It was not one of the first ten rights afforded to citizens of this country, and it wasn't until after the Civil War that we actually got the, the right to, to, to vote uh, as citizens. Uh, and from that point on, uh, after the Civil War, 19, 1870 to be exact, if I recall correctly, and you can correct Sounds me right. if I'm wrong, uh, it took 95 years until 1965 to actually have the Voting Rights Act. Lots of that period of time were struggles for the former African slaves, yes. uh, now free American citizens, in fact, to be able to freely go to the polls and vote, which had become a right to them. And um, don't forget about women. And, long and, struggle and, for and, the women's vote. And women, uh, 1920? That's right. Not that long ago, less than That's 100 right. years ago. The year my mother was born. Oh. She still remembers. How? Wow. When she was like 10 years old, she well, remembers that women, well, her mother, oh God, going to vote. God, God, God bless her. Yeah. So what, what can you tell us about what occurred in this country? How, how, how important is the right to vote amongst the other rights that we have as American citizens? Well, interestingly, it has been a steady march of progress. Different groups have fought their way in to many constitutional rights, actually, in this country. Um, and it's something I, I think sometimes we tend to forget because there has been a lot of progress, women, minorities, whatever it was. But there have been a lot of struggles along the way, and we still struggle to maintain those rights. For me, it's the fundamental right of a democracy. It is probably the most precious thing we have. And but, it, but I also feel like this, at this time in our history, we have to renew that sense among people because I think people have forgotten some of these struggles. They take these things for granted now, uh, much more than previously. Uh, in my generation, this was taught from a very early age mm -hmm. in school. And I'm always, uh, we've done a lot of work in the area of trying to figure out where, why there are so few people voting. I think that's the real crisis in this country, okay. is that so few people still feel that deep you know, sense of this, mm -hmm. not just a right, but almost a duty as a citizen mm -hmm. to participate. And yeah. it's changed, yeah. it's changed. And, and, and what is the danger of that lack of participation? Well, I think unless citizens are actively involved in their government, it will fail. It will continue to march toward being an oligarchy, which means a very small group of people will start to have all the power and all the money. And, and it's happened in so many countries in the world. And of course, this was the great beacon of freedom. This was the country where everyone could participate. But unless you keep 
bringing new people in because you have to bring every group of new people in. I mean, the Irish were, were not considered part of society when they first got here. And they were not, they were discouraged from voting. They weren't allowed to vote in many places. So every new group has fought their way in, including women too. I mean, mm -hmm. for many years, it was just thought crazy to have women voting, you know, it was just an insane idea. And so women had to fight their way in and people fought and died for those rights. But now, you know, it's, it's, a, more, it's a more difficult time, I think, in many ways. There's a a lot of dissatisfaction with government. Um, there's a drumbeat of, uh, you know, the evils of big government and it's doing bad things to you. And so I think people have gotten discouraged. But unless we have everyone at the table, then that table becomes smaller all the time because the people who do participate will take over everything. You yeah. know? And so unless you're out there participating, you know, don't get don't don't complain if you're not participating because you have no right to complain anymore because they will make all the decisions without you very happily. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> yes, I've I've often told folks when 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 they say why 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 should I register and vote and I say well uh, take for example your mayor uh, every 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 town has a mayor and the mayor of Hartford for example will be elected whether by. 44,000 votes, That's voters, right. or by 500 voters. That's right. Um, and depending on yeah. how many you will actually participate and vote, uh, not only makes the mayoralty stronger, but also makes it more representative. Because as we see every day in the newspapers and on television, politicians respond to the squeaky wheels. To yes. those who, who talk, to those who participate, to those who write, those who send text messages, they, they, they really listen to them. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, if, if, if you're in mind, uh, one of the great things about our democracy is that we're allowed to, part, to be part of our governance. We, in fact, are self-governed, if you would. So, so, exactly. the, saying, so yes. the saying goes, uh, which requires then our participation in governance. Uh, and, and the right to vote is part of that. Um, there are some places in this country currently where, where folks who do not have a right to vote because they're not citizens, but they're here legally, uh, and, and being legal residents have to send their kids to school, <laughs> but without the right to vote and boards of education, they can't participate in the governance of their schools. And in some places are contemplating, I understand that some places actually pass laws and it, it exists today, some places are contemplating allowing non-citizen parents to participate in the election of their school boards as long as they have children in the school. Any thoughts on that? I am someone who's reluctant to give up on the idea that citizenship is critical. Mm -hmm. I am I would rather see us work on trying to make everybody understand the power of citizenship. Mm -hmm. And and right now, I mean, the federal government, they have to solve this problem at the federal level so that we understand so people understand that they can become citizens. I'm told that there's fully half of the people that are here illegally or Ill, or legally uh, once we solve the illegality problem, which I think needs to happen. We need to have you know, a new program around all this. But once you're eligible to be a citizen, there are a lot of people that still don't become citizens. So I want everyone to be a citizen. That's what I want. Okay. I want to see them have that power because there has to be something to that for me. Okay. Okay. Good, good. Uh, I know you, you, you like to talk a little bit about the National Voter Registration Day. Yes. Uh, you've been uh, really working on that quite a bit. Tell us a little bit about what that is and, and, and what it does and how, how you're part of that movement. Yes. Um, we're very excited about it. It's the first time we've done anything like this in Connecticut. I'm part of a national group of secretaries of state. And I'm chair uh, of the Voter Participation Committee, primarily because that is my passion. Okay. <laughs> you asked before, that's yeah. it. And uh, so we're just trying to think of ways we can inspire people mm -hmm. to become citizens, to, to go out and vote, and to understand their power as a person in our society. So uh, we're trying to bring attention to it any way we can. You know, the traditional way here, you make it a day. So this is 
Voter Registration Day. And what we dreamed up in Connecticut is a contest. And the contest is for young people. Because to me, the most important thing we can do is bring in the next generation. Listen, some of us are getting tired. Mm -hmm. Been doing this a long time. And it's time for the next generation. We have to make them understand it's their job now. Mm -hmm. And so we have a contest that high school students, any high school in Connecticut, will participate. And they'll have a team of students who will register people to vote. Okay. Not just other students, but people in the community. Okay. Because we're trying to get make those connections. Because mm -hmm. that's what we have found works best. You have to ask people in. Yeah. And that is a powerful lesson I think we learned when we started asking people why you participate, why do you run for mayor, why do you do what you do, why do you participate in the schools? Because someone asks you. And that's, that's an important point, I think. So we're hoping these students will go out and ask, ask people to register to vote. And we have a little contest, so whoever registers the most, whatever school registers the most voters, they will get a special session with their U.S. Senator, uh, Richard Blumenthal, and myself to do something that kids seem to know what this is. It's called an AMA, Ask Me Anything. <laughs> okay. And they'll be able to put it on the Twitter or whatever, you know, <laughs> social media they want to. And so we hope that'll give them some sense of ownership, you know. Okay. So anyway, so okay. that's our uh, that's our celebration of National Voter Registration Day. Excellent. <laughs> Great idea. AM, ask Me Anything. That's cool. <laughs> kind of reminds me of Call Me Anything, but late for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's a little bit about this program. This is kind of an ask me anything, right? Absolutely, absolutely. An AMA. Well, any 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 message that you would like to give to our viewing audience uh, uh, today? Yes, actually, I think it's about this year's election in particular because it is not a presidential election. It is not an election for governor, and in most places, it's not even an election for mayor. But it's an election for people who are going to impact their lives every day. Boards of education, planning and zoning committees. You know, these are jobs, mostly they don't get paid any money to do it. But you want to you wanna have something to say about those people who are representing you. And it starts at the community level. And so, of all years to go out and vote, this is the year. And people don't understand that because they listen to the news and they hear, you know, all about, I want to vote for president. And that's great. Don't get me wrong, but it's more important almost to vote for people at the local level. So November 5th, you have a chance to vote for these people that might be your next door neighbor. And it's so important. And I just wish I could communicate that to more people. Great message. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Um, there's so much under this heading that I hope you will uh, uh, accept invitations in the future to come and discuss more minute details of uh, empowering uh, citizens uh, uh, in this in, in this country in our society and thank you very much our viewing audience for being here with us I invite you to please visit my webpage at cafeconluis.com and participate Make sure that you stay on top of the things that are going on in the, your community. Make an effort to vote. We're making it easier year by year to you to participate in how we govern ourselves. Take care and be well.